How's everybody doing tonight? I hope everybody's having a good night. Uh, gonna let a few people roll in. Uh, I'm out here struggle streaming. See, it's gonna flow in. Kind of dragging tonight, but we're gonna see what's gonna happen. Let's see. You know how we do it. If we got any uh, cybersecurity questions or tech questions, just drop them in the chat. You said we're going to talk about HIPAA, high trust, high tech, talk a little health information tonight. One of the big compliances. Uh, let me check on my LinkedIn as I struggle streaming, <laughs> trying to get set up over there. Uh, got to get my LinkedIn, not, yeah, my LinkedIn skills up a little bit. So. I think I just need to do it more and more and more and more and more and we'll get better. So um, just closing down a few windows. I got a gazillion windows open. <laughs> Try to free up a little memory. Like I said, I'm going to hit my LinkedIn. We're going to get started here shortly. Let me get my LinkedIn. Mm -mm -mm. Tired. Been a rough week for me. So, but. That's part of the game. You're going to have good days and bad days. Let's see. I'm trying to see if I can find it. I know I can post an activity. Uh, once again, you know how we do it. Trying to do a little housekeeping. Let's see. Casual Economist is in there. Yeah, do that for me, Casual Economist. I just did a welcome over there. It came up, so I think I'm over there. If you get yeah, a peek over there for me a little bit, I'm definitely struggle streaming. Salute to Wire Dog, giving out great content. That's me over there giving people welcome. So if you want to go over there and link to me on LinkedIn, that's my government name. So you can come and find me. I'm over there. With the 1985 flip phone, I need to upgrade my, my picture. I don't know why I have it. So once again, uh, people know I do a GRC, Governor's Risk and Compliance. I've been doing that for 15 years in the cybersecurity game. Um, I got my bachelor's in computer science in 1990. So that's how long I've been in the game. So going to get it started. Once again, you know how we do it. If you got any IT questions or cybersecurity questions, just put them in the box. Now I gotta go check on my LinkedIn because casual kind of has gone over there. Then we're gonna go get it started. So like I said, gonna go get it started. Okay, I see a few things. I'm over there. I'm I'm live. So Caesar in the house, appreciate you. So let's get back on the YouTube. We're gonna get it rolling. Um, two, we know that um these are three huge uh, compliances by themselves. HIPAA by itself, high trust by itself, and high tech, high tech by itself are so big compliance. So we're just going to touch our uh, foot in the water, then we're going to add to it and do some more videos and focus on each one individually. I just want to show the, the interplay between those three and how they work together. If you go out to do the, if you go to Indeed and put HIPAA in, there's a lot of jobs that comes up for that, right? We know hospitals huge. Um, uh, health and hospital pays a lot of bills. Hospitals are in that. Nursing homes are in there. There's a lot of uh, downstream uh, businesses that get that HIPAA money for the government. So that's one reason it's a super, a super good compliance to learn. So let's get it going. I should do better on these. So we're just going to just kind of chop it up about it. So HIPAA, high tech, high trust are all interrelated in this way. They have distinct differences for specific functions in data privacy and information security space. HIPAA is an act that outlines compliance expectations for the protection of health information, including transmission and management of it. High tech, which falls under the HIPAA umbrella, expands the latter to include additional modernization legislation that broadens the scope of health information security and perspective. Right, so HIPAA, and we're going to see the date. It was 
been around forever. High tech was to modernize it, bring security up, bring privacy up, because so many people were getting hacked. And the new part of that is high trust. It's an organization that provides cert certifications to organization for demonstrating compliance with both HIPAA and high tech regulations. So you're talking about SOC reports, um, SOC 2 type 2 reports. You're talking about NIST 800 53. You're talking about Fed ramp compliance and physical compliance. Of course, healthcare had to get in that game, right, and get some of that money. But two is trying to make sure they're certified and doing what they're supposed to do. That that's really the the thing you're trying to um, drill down into. What what are you doing for once again health information? Uh, that applies to dentists because they get paid from uh, HSS and the government. So a lot of um, downstream businesses and organization. Uh, do need to comply with HIPAA. HIPAA, which is short for Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, it was first introduced in 1996. Uh, it required the United States Department of Health and Hospital uh, Secretary to issue national guidelines for security for electronic protected health information, right? So you'll see PHI a lot because everything went digital. So how do you protect it? Hospitals, finally got to digital. There's a ton of information moving around on the internet and just networks, all right? So how do you protect it? Electronic inter interchange, health information, privacy, as well as security. The three tiers of necessary health information exchange under HIPAA includes treatment, payment, and operations. During a time of immense technology advancement, HIPAA also establishes to accommodate the modernization of occurring with the healthcare industry. Most notably, the set of regulations address the advancements of technology, telecommunications within healthcare industry, aiming to legislate issues surrounding, once again, data access, privacy, and sharing. All right, because you go in a testing center, hospitals, uh, your, your insurance plan, your insurance plan at work, right? Then we know the government's got their insurance plan. All that health information data is moving around <laughs> at light speed. Once again, how do you protect it? What regulations do you need to do it? And what hardening do you need to do it? And that's where these three HIPAA, high tech and high trust uh, interplay and interrelated comes to help you secure that information, right? Once again, how do we do that? HIPAA also established several rights of the, for those in the United States that receive healthcare services on the privacy rule. The privacy rule establishes standard uh, regarding individual rights to personal health inf information, accessibility, how individual protected information is used, and individual entitlements to understand and influence the way their health information is utilized. Through these mechanisms, the privacy rules ensures the protection of individual health information while also allowing access to those that need to make the information for medical and administrative decisions. Therefore, the privacy rule is flexible enough to be applied to a array of use cases related to the exchange of health information. All right, we're talking about flat files, internet, web service calls, there's just a lot of health information out there. And now we're talking about uh, smart watches, uh, glucose monitors, there's just so many other ways where you uh, collecting health information and once again moving it around once again so how do you protect it or make sure it is being protected the privacy rule for reproductive health care uh april 12 2023 those who are issued a, a notice of uh, proposed uh proposed rulemaking to strengthen the health insurance portability act known as hipaa uh, protection prohibit the use of disclosure protected health information to identify investigate prosecute or sue patient providers others involve the uh, provision of legal reproductive health care hss has heard from patients providers and organizations representing thousands of individuals that this change was needed to protect patient provider confidentiality and prevent private medical records from being used against them merely for seeking obtaining providing facilitate lawful reproductive health care, right? So where do you fall on that line? What, I guess, what's your, uh, I guess, your affiliation leaning? But overall, that um, privacy needs to be, be protected and that data needs to be, be protected. And that's one, one reason HIPAA, once again, is a very large 
compliance that used it in a ton of uh, places and uh, such things too. Let me see what's going on on my um, LinkedIn side. Once again, if you got any questions, uh, tech or cybersecurity, just drop them in the box. Let's go, Caesar in the house. Appreciate you. So let's keep rolling. These are some of the types of covered entities, medical providers, uh, private practices, critical access hospitals, healthcare systems, integrated delivery, uh, hybrid works, health insurances, and uh, business associates. All right. A business associate is somebody that works for a covered entity. So like if you're a medical practitioner, your analyst might be a third party um, company. So you would need a business associate to cover them for their for their HIPAA um, privacy rules, uh, policies and procedures. And we're going to dig a little more in the, they call them BAAs. Um, and we're going to, of course, dig into AWS and how you can configure your AWS services to be uh, HIPAA certified, which would actually be high trust. Right? High trust gives out those certifications for HIPAA compliance. So health plans. Purpose of health plans include health insurance companies, HMO, health maintenance organizations, employer sponsor health plans, government programs that pay for health care, like medical, Medicaid, and military and veterans health programs. Right, those are types of health plans that once again needs uh, to protect your PHI for your HIPAA certifications. Let's see, got a few LinkedIn questions. I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it, Ben. So if I see a piece, check out the subscribe. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining. So let's keep rolling. Once again, there's a three big domains. So we're just going to put our foot in the toe tonight. Then we're going to dig deeper into each one of those separate HIPAA, high tech, and high trust. We're going to touch on those once again in a separate video and dig down deep into each one of those. So clearing houses include organization that processes non-standard health information to conform to standards for data content format or vice versa on behalf of other organizations. So a lot of times you see your data to clearinghouse, it's going to change into another format that's for insurance companies, it's going to change into another format that's specific for hospitals. And if you look out there, there's a typical health files. I should have looked those up. If you're doing a certain medical type, your record needs to look a certain way. If you're doing uh, research, your uh, records should look a certain way, right? So it's trying to bring organizations so it's easier to share information with other entities. Um, once again, I did a little bit of that um, when I was working for a large state government because we share data files with everybody, right? So part of that was uh, HIPAA files. Providers who submit HIPAA transactions like claims electronically cover. These providers include, but are not limited to, doctors, clinics, psychologists, dentists, chiropractors, nursing homes, and pharmacies. They all connect HIPAA data and they all get paid by the government or exchange data with the government. So just real quick, if you look at smartwatches and um, uh, Samsung and Apple Medical, a lot of times they're not HIPAA certified because they're not getting paid by the government, right? So if you're doing business with the government, the government's going to say you need to be HIPAA certified, high tech or high trust uh, certified or validated because they want to make sure their money secured and the records are secure. And the government's going to put those regulations on you, right? Just not a regular person. So that's some of the differences when you start digging into it. What what does it actually look like from a, from a HIPAA HIPAA certification. So let's keep rolling. If you go out there and look at Upworks and uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones, there's a lot of HIPAA work out there. A lot of people are confused about what documents you need, what policies and procedures you need. How do you actually configure your network in AWS or Azure or Google to be high trust certified, to be HIPAA compliant, right? To be high trust, high tech compliant. Right. How do you make those things happen so you can sell your software to hospitals? So when I was doing freelance work, people, what's up, Ty? People will reach out to me and ask me to help them set up their uh, software so it could be HIPAA compliant, high tech compliant, or high trust certified so they can sell them once again to, you see the providers right there. You can sell them to doctors, clinics, 
psychologists, dentists, chiropractors, nursing homes, and pharmacists. You just can't do a, a, a software for hospitals or especially a large hospital and think you're just going to walk in there with no compliances, no policies and procedures, no architect diagram, and once again, no high choice certification. So that that's where, once again, the, it becomes into effect. And, and you, once again, use it. And a lot of people talk about getting careers in it. Definitely a career. We know Epic is the... The, the the software cert, so the software choice for large hospital that's HIPAA and high tech certified and how it moves files around. So what is a business associate? If a covered entity, we saw what those were, engaged in a business associate to help carry out healthcare activities and functions that cover entity must have written business association contract or the or other arrangements with a business associate, establish specifically what business associate has been engaged to do required a business associate to comply with HIPAA. Examples of a business associate includes third-party administrators that assist health plans with claims processing, consultants that perform utilization reviews for a hospital, healthcare clearinghouses that translate a claim for a non-standard format into a standard transaction on behalf of the healthcare provider, and force that process transaction to a payer. Independent medical transcriptionist that provides transcription services for physicians. Because they're dealing with HIPAA and high trust and high tech health information, the third parties that deal with that data has to come under HIPAA compliance. The business associate basically just says your third party has to be HIPAA compliance to be able to do medical information type work. Right, that's what it is in a high level in. Once again, super active and there are, those are actually growing out there. So protected information, we're gonna drill down to this. The privacy rule that protects our individual identified health information held or transmission by, transmitted by a cover entity or its business associate in the form of media with the electronic paper or oral. The privacy rules call this information protected health information. It individually identified health information is information including demographic Democratic, I'm sorry, demographic data that relates to individual past, presence, or future physical or mental or, or health conditions, provision of health care to an individual, the past, present, or future payment for the provision of health care to the individual that, in, that identifies the individual for what there is reasonable basis to believe can be used to identify the individual. Identify uh, health information include many common identifiers name, address, uh, birth date, social security number, or some of the uh, PHI elements. And you, of course, you want to protect them, encrypt them, lock them down, use MFA controls. What is your definition of a breach, right? So one of the things that happens is if you get, and we've seen a ton of hospitals get hacked and breach. So what is breach generally? Uh, impermissible use of disclosure on the privacy rules that compromise the security of privacy of protected health information and impermissible use of disclosure of uh, protected inf health information presumes to be a breach unless the covered entity or business associate is applicable demonstrates that there's low probability that the protected uh, health information has been compromised based on a risk assessment of at least the following factors the, nat the nature and extent of protected health information involved, types of identi identifiers, and the likelihood of re-identification, right? So if we encrypt my data and it's saved somewhere and somebody steals that disk, could they unencrypt it to re-identify that that's my health information? So that's what re-identification, or a lot of times you talk about we're going to de-identify, but it's in a small town, not a lot of people. And if you have enough identifiers, you could probably figure out if it's that person in the small town. So that's what you have to protect against. The unauthorized person who used the protected information or whom the disclosure was made, whether the protected information was actually acquired and viewed, the extent to which the risk to the protected information has been mitigated, right? So a lot of times if you have <clears throat> AES-256 or federal level encryption and encryption actually been validated. If somebody stole the disk 
off your laptop or the disk off your phone, the government does believe a normal citizen or a high level nation could decrypt that data, right? So theoretically you get an outscape that you're using high level of encryption. So here's just some of the finds. Uh, they have different levels. You see that culpability right there. That's why you should do uh, negligent and due care. So you see right there, if you have a lack of knowledge, which is tier one, uh, you get $137 of fine, maximum penalty, uh, violation of inflation and justice, $6,000. Maximum penalty per year is $2 million. If you do reasonable care, all right, your minimum penalty for the violation is uh, $1,379 per violation. Once again, you get max and max per penalty for your years, two million. If you willfully neglect, all right, meaning you did almost nothing, you get $13,000 of fine. Once again, you get your max penalty for violation and you see your maximum there. Willful neglect, not corrected within 30 days, you can get $68,000 of fine. Max penalty per violation is two million, but you still cap out at two million, right? So the more security you have, the more privacy you have, the more <laughs> hardening you have, the less your fine gonna be because you show that you you uh, lack of knowledge could be a zero day. You're not gonna stop at zero day, even if it's lack of knowledge. That's only one hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars. If you did nothing right and you did willful neglect, right, you were negligent. That's thirteen thousand dollars of fine. Right. So if you got, you know, 100,000 records at 13,000, the cool thing is, I, I guess we'll say cool, it's going to max out at $2 million for, for HIPAA. Right. Which for large companies, that nothing. But if you're a small company, it could take you out of business. So that's why we said you should be do care and not be negligent and have a security program. Because once again, these fines can be substantial and depending on the size of your hospital. $2 million could actually take you out. So let's keep rolling. I, I, for some reason, I like those. <laughs> I like this slide. So once again, we're going to uh, dip over to high tech. Uh, HIPAA privacy rules were modernized with the inception of HIF, uh, health information technology uh, for economic and clinical health, aka high tech. The act was passed in Congress in 2009 representing a new piece of legislation under HIPAA. HIPAA is getting a little stale. High tech added value updates to HIPAA that encourage the use of secure electronic health records in the e in an EHR system, expanding the scope of responsibilities surrounding cover entities. These major additions include ability for patients to access their electronic information, incentives for companies and institutions to implement uh, EHR systems, expansion of HIPAA, uh, HIPAA cover entities to include business associate, more stringent penalties for HIPAA violations. We saw a few of those rules for addressing data breaches. Right. So those are the things high tech came in. Once again, more modernization, more computer uh, security, trying to make sure we're locked down and safe and, and not getting hacked. Once again, HIPAA is um, a unique compliance. Use the term patient access. High tech expands HIPAA by not just regulating the protection of health information, but also the way it shares uh, electronic electronics amongst patients, physicians, and healthcare systems. Under high tech, individual has the rights to access the electronic health information held by covered entities and business associates. Now, most hospitals and everything has a patient portal, right? So you can see what's uh, in the systems. You can make edits to the system, right? And hopefully, sorry about that, and correct some of the information that's held in those electronic systems. It's it's, it's the individual right to attain a copy of the PHI electronically. If desired, additionally, the individual can ask the entity to provide a copy to another entity or, or designated individual given the decision to, but is both clear and specific, right? Once again, we're passing data around. We make sure it's tight. So once again, you need new regulation rules uh, and systems and compliances to make that happen. The high tech also enacted new requirements for HIPAA covered entities, particularly uh, regards to business associate. 
Business associate is defined as an individual entity that performs specific duties or responsibility requiring the use of exchange of protected health information. Business associate works on behalf of covered entities. The High Tech Act ensures that such business associate covered entities comply with HIPAA rules. Uh, the DHS Office for Civil Rights, OCR, provides rule to change the HIPAA privacy, security, breach notification, enforcement rules. Amongst the changes was a final rule that ensured HIPAA rules also apply to business associate. Therefore, business associates consider considered directly liable for HIPAA violation, which expands the requirement of HIPAA beyond just hospitals, insurance companies, and further applies to anyone managing uh, PHI uh, information, right? Protected health information. Uh, we're going to dig a little bit in there. AWS is a business uh, associate. Why? You're putting your HIPAA data into AWS, be it uh, EC2s, databases, web server, app servers. We know uh, AWS has a ton of services. So how do you know if you're, those services you, you're using are um, high trust certified or HIPAA compliant? All right. So we're going to delve into that. Uh, AWS has a ton of documentation for that. We looked at the penalties a minute ago. Outside including a business associate, the High Tech Act also expanded a range of HIPAA privacy and security rules. This expansion implemented several provisions and more intense penalties for non-compliance, thereby increasing the criminal, criminal and civil, uh, civil enforcement. For example, the High Tech Act implemented four hierarchical categories of violations. We were looking at some of those with each level corresponding to the penalty. The penalty amounts to increase significant with each violation, with the penalty amounts extended to 1.5, right? And we looked at those uh, a minute ago. Um, so if you're negligent or not doing due care, right, your fines are a lot higher if, you know, you give a zero trust. I'm, I'm sorry, a, a zero day attack. Uh, it could be as little as $138 for that particular fine per record, though, so. Once again, data breaches under high tech. Uh, HIPAA provides foundational guidance surrounding the release. While high tech builds upon these standards regarding data breaches, in the event of unsecured, unsecured breach, high tech outline notification requirements for cutter entities to abide by. HIPAA covered entities are required to alert affected individuals at, after any level of data breaches. For breaches that affect less than 500 uh, people, entities should notify the DHS uh, secretary annually. If the breach affects greater than 500 people, the entity must contact both the DHS secretary as well as the uh, media immediately. These change holds cover entities and business associate accountable to specific government bodies that affected individuals or, or for providing adequate protection of health information. So if you're over 500 people, once again, you got to reach out to the Department of Health and a hospital uh, security and the secretary. And two is you got to go on the media and make it known that could be print or on the TV and let people know in that area that there has been a breach. Um, I wouldn't say the cool thing. Now with computer systems, most people, we have your name, address, and your email so we can actually send you correspondence. And I'm sure everybody got them. There's so many <laughs> breaches. I'm sure there's very few people that hasn't had a hack to been a breach. So you get in the mail or you get an email saying that you've been breached. We're going to give you credit and monitoring. And this is what you need to do to um, to affect that, right, to, to help you um, mitigate, I guess, your loss of being breached. Once again, high check, high trust. So that's the trifecta, right? We talked about HIPAA, high tech, and high trust. Another term that's frequently associated with HIPAA and high tech is high trust. High trust is the, also known as the Health Enforcement Trust Alliance. It's not a law like HIPAA or high tech. Instead, it's a well-known private organization founded in 2007. High trust created a common security framework, which offers an approach for organizations to assure adherence to several regulatory standards as well as risk management, right? So, once again, a private well-known organization took upon itself to create high trust. I'm sure they charge you for that, right? But you can get certified in it to say your system is validated to protect, once again, health information. 
Right. So let's see. My man Chris is in the house. How's it going? About to hop over there. Appreciate it. Mr. First 30, it's all good. Check it out on the replay. XL Pro, glad you could join me. Check out my man, Rondo Mono, Paper Pat. Oh, congratulations. I see two uh, C plus decks. Uh, congratulations. Getting there. Making progress. So let's keep going. We're talking about the high trust, which is the certification um, for HIPAA and high, high for HIPAA and, and high tech. Once again, it's a private organization that does it. Kind of like state ramp. We talked about state ramp. Uh, another private organization. Even though they made it a nonprofit, it was created by a private private organization. So uh, once again, high trust created a common security framework for healthcare information. High trust, the common security framework provides a method that can be utilized by all types of entities to create and maintain and exchange sensitive or regulatory regulated information. The high trust CSF integrates with nationally and internationally accepted security and privacy related standards, including HIPAA, ISO, NIST, and PSI, and GDPR. By doing so, it provides a widespread set of security and privacy controls to ensure compliance across the globe. Not all controls contained with the CSF are relevant to HIPAA, however, all HIPAA requirements are embedded within the framework. Right, so what they're saying is the CSF is a super set of controls, and in there, it will cover HIPAA. I always say more controls, the merrier, because, right, uh, you could try more controls, hopefully you'll be more secure, your security program will be more enforced, more privacy, more, once again, more security controls. So what's the interplay between HIPAA, high tech, and high trust? Anyone who manages PHI information, including companies like Tech Blocks, must comply with HIPAA and associated high tech regulations. The, high, the implementation of High Tech Act both change and strengthening the pre-existing foundation of HIPAA legislation. Also, the aforementioned High Tech Act strengthens HIPAA in several ways, most notably including uh, the inclusion of breach notification rule, the accountability of business associated with data breaches, the expenses of violation and penalty infrastructure, the changes impact business specifically in our sector who must develop solutions to address both set of rules. It's important for any organization that utilize protected health information to be HIPAA compliant. However, there is no HIPAA certification existed to prove compliance until the enactment of high trust. High trust established the standardization of compliance for any institution by holding HIPAA and high tech uh, standards, right? So high, tr high trust gives you this uh, standardization and compliance for HIPAA and high tech. The high trust information alliance common security framework, high trust CSF incorporates nationally and internationally accepted security frameworks such as ISO, my favorite one is NIST 800-53 to create a comprehensive set of baseline security privacy controls tethered to uh, your specific data flows and architecture. We might go over to NIST 800, uh, I think it's 66 for HIPAA uh, controls. For some reason, I didn't put any of those slides in there. But once again, the high trust is going to leverage uh, nationally and international frameworks. It's already there. Why, why would you create the framework, right? So you're going to use those as base uh, base frameworks. Then you're going to put your enhancements for uh, PHI on top of ISO 271 and this 800S53. High Trust was developed a CSF assurance program, which incorporates common requirements, methodologies, and tools, which enables an organization and its business partners to take a consistent and incremental approach to managing compliance. Moreover, it allows business partners and vendors to assess and report against multiple set of requirements to satisfy our favorite thing, third-party risk assessment, right? So when you're doing business with companies, they're going to ask for a third-party risk assessment. That's going to be high trust, SOC 2, type 2, uh, FISMA, if you're in uh, DOD and federal work. So there's different, once again, certifications and assessments and attestations that you can get with your write-ups that says, what you're doing is uh, approved by this particular um, 
High Trust, CSF, FISMA. Once again, there's a ton of organizations out there. So let's talk about AWS. You know, that's one of my favorite cloud. So AWS, once again, helps you become HIPAA and, and, and high trust compliant and, and certified. Let's see what Command Casual. I switch back to YouTube. I get your channel back on my top watch. I appreciate you, Casual Economist. I appreciate you. Let me go over there and peek. But once again, we're going to touch on AWS. And you see there, we're going to look at AWS services and scope by compliance program. The compliance program, we're going to look at HIPAA and high trust and see some of the services that they say is already uh, certified to do that type of work. Let's see, I'm rolling over there. We're looking good on um, LinkedIn. Trying to do a little more over there. Trying to get my LinkedIn numbers up, but let's get back on YouTube. So once again, so let's check it out. AWS services and scope. So, and we talk about this. And, and specifically for third party, I was in the GRC study hall before I came over here chopping it up. We were talking about third party assessment. Part of your third party assessment is making sure services uh, that you are using, that you use to create your product in AWS or certified to do that type of work. You see, this is AWS, as so you see it right there. High Trust CSF, these are some of the services. They have hundreds of services. And you can see if it's certified to do uh, HIPAA, uh, high trust, high tech type work. Right? So Gap, a Amazon API Gateway, Chime, CloudFront, CloudWatch, Cognito. Once again, so I will look up if somebody said we were using these services. Once again, for a third party assessment, I will look up in AWS to make sure those services are certified to do that type of work. Uh, once again, this is their HIPAA eligible services, right? Alexa's, uh, Amplify, once again, App Service Sync, Mesh, Aurora, which is uh, their database, one of their databases that you could use. So once again, you want to make sure in AWS, those services you create to create your architecture is HIPAA or high trust certified. So you can sell it to a hospital. You can sell it. You saw those covered entities, uh, psychiatric uh, companies. So. Once again, I I do this um, for companies, vendors, startups to to help them get their paperwork ready so they can get certain certifications. So let's see. Up, oh, shout out to my man, my salute. So let's keep rolling. Talking about that AWS. Um, until you go to their frameworks, AWS Healthcare Compliance and Alignments and Frameworks. AWS compliance certifications. AWS certification demonstrates security of the cloud, operates effectiveness of AWS controls. Customer inherits these compliance certifications and can use them to demonstrate part of their compliance to auditors and regulators. That's why a lot of people like to start their business in AWS because if you use those services we looked at, they have uh, compliance certifications, once again, so you could pass an auditor and audit. Compliance certification and, and attestations are assessed by third party and independent auditors and results in certification, audit reports, and attestation of compliance. Once again, laws, regulations, and privacy. AWS customers remain responsible for complying with Apple Global compliance laws, regulations, in some cases, AWS officers. Functionality such as security features enable legal agreements such as AWS data processing agreements. Uh, business associates and support customer compliance. No formal certification is available to or distributed by a cloud service provider within these laws and regulation domain, right? So that's uh, from a laws, but from certification, right? That high trust was in there and they could actually certify you for that. Let me see. I think I heard somebody ping me. Oh, make sure. So let's keep it going. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. We're going to drop down a link if you want to come up and ask some specific questions. Let's keep it rolling. And here is, once again, as a third-party assessor, security architect, this will be considered an AWS HIPAA Trust certified uh, architecture, um, meaning all these have been approved in that list we saw for HIP or high trust work. And all these um, 
services here, right? Uh, load balancers, internal load balancers, web web application firewalls, EC2s, right? Windows or Linux application servers, IIS or Apache databases, uh, AWS cloud HSMs. That's where you save your keys and pull them out. Uh, DynamoDB, Redshift for data warehousing. An EMR, right? We were talking about that inside of uh, uh, HIPAA certified uh, uh, S3 buckets to save backup snapshots and keys, cloud trail for logging, Route 53 for DNS. All of these components has been certified to do HIPAA work. So if you would actually configure your uh, AWS to do HIPAA work, once again, you could get those high trust certifications. We were looking at what services were um, had those compliances and certification and attestations, right? So you can do HIPAA work. And two is once again, we're going to dig in later videos and dr drill down to HIPAA specific, to high tech specific, and to high trust specific things. So that's all I had. I'm going to drop the link. I think I'm going to look up while we uh, still here. I think I'm going to look up. Um, this 866 which is the HIPAA portion of that. I think that the only issue, shout out to Dr. Finesse in the house. So if you want to come up and ask any questions, you can. Or if you can put them in the chat or if you just want to relax. So let's look up the HIPAA high trust uh, real quick from this 800-66. I am tired. I need the weekend to get here. Oh, yeah, that's super old. I guess I didn't know it was that old. It's coming up. Okay, that's Rev 2. Oh, Rev 2 is 2024. I take that back. So let's switch over and do a little NIST. Everybody know I'm a NIST guy. <laughs> so that's what I do for a living. So let's... Um, Get over to NIST real quick and kind of just dig in real quick. We're going to get too super detailed with it. Most people know I, I love NIST. Um, Rev 2 came out uh, February 2024. So it's definitely new. I guess I didn't know it was out. I guess I need to do a video on that. Uh, the draft uh, was 2021. The final work right there was... 866 Rev 2, 2022. So a lot of times when I do HIPAA work, because I usually base my stuff on this, I actually use NIST 866 to help me map my NIST over to HIPAA. All right. So let's let's dig into it real quick. We ain't gonna dig into it because usually NIST documentation is be big as crazy. Oh, it's only 122 pages, so we just tap on it a little bit. Once again, I dropped the link if anybody want to come up. Uh, there, let me make it a little bigger. So R2, NIST, free of charge. You see it right there. Where's my date? February 2024, which is this year. Let's just look at the abstract. Uh, HIPAA security rules. We're just talking about the safeguarding electronic uh, protected health information, health to maintain by regulatory information. Regulatory entity creates, receives, maintains, transmit, must protect against reasonable anticipated threats, hazard, uh, and uh, impermissible use or disclosure. This uh, publication provides practical guidance and resources that can be used by regulated entities of all sizes to safeguard and better understand the concept. So we're just gonna look at the Table of contents. So we talked about the HIPAA security rules, talk about guidance. Once again, we have the risk. These are the policies they're looking for from a HIPAA perspective, security management process, assigned security responsibility, workforce security, information access. We know we need that security awareness training, right? So those are all positive things. So that's 66. Uh, it's definitely needed. I'll definitely put it in the description at the end of the videos so you can click on it. Facilities, I'm sorry, physical safeguards. A lot of people, a lot of bigger hospitals still run their own data center. Technical safeguards, access, 
control, audit controls, integrity, and that. Uh, BAA, how do you do your contracts? You got to review your contracts, and there's got to be certain languages that are in your contracts. Once again, policies and procedures. Let's see, there was some good stuff. Um, let's look at the tables. Well, let's look at common threats. Let me see here, 17. So you got your natural, human, and environmental. So when you do your threats, those are some of the common ones. 19, you have a uh, likelihood of threats, uh, results in adverse, very low, low, moderate, high. So that helps you figure out, we call it BIA, your business impact analysis. Let's see, who came to join me. My man, Chris, what's going on? <laughs> How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Figured I'd hop over here. Um, definitely a topic I wanted to learn more about. I did miss the first part, but what I'm trying to catch up on is, so my understanding mm -hmm. is the HIPAA, high tech, and high trust all work together. Yep. I talked about that, the interplay of that. And I can. Okay. I'll pull up the yeah, slide and... real quick and find it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll find that slide. Oh, yeah. About that. No, that's perfect. Yeah, that was kind of my understanding there. And then uh, it looks like you're starting to dig into the HIPAA portion of it, right? Yeah, I was actually doing more of the, uh, I did the HIPAA earlier. I just did it from a NIST perspective. I like, you know me, I like NIST documentation. But here's the interplay. Let's hit it real quick. Anyone who manages a PHI, which is protected information, they did a fictitious tech blocks, must comply with HIPAA and associated high tech rules. The implementation of high tech act both uh, changes and strengthens the pre-existing HIPAA legislation. Uh, high tech actually, because people were doing more computers and uh, health exchange uh, information between uh, hospitals, your insurance companies, and even your uh, company, because you're paying money to make sure you know you have health coverage. How do you exchange that data in a standard format? That was high tech. Strengthen that in HIPAA several ways, most notably in the inclusion of breach notification, the accountability of associated data breaches. The expansion of violation and penalties, the change impact businesses specifically in the sector who must develop solutions to address both set of rules. Once again, HIPAA and high tech. The importance of any organization utilizing protected information to be HIPAA compliant. However, no HIPAA certification existed to prove compliance until the enactment of high trust. High trust established a standardization for compliance for any institution upholding HIPAA and high tech. So that's kind of it at a high level, Chris. And I was a little uh, light on that, that interplay myself. So, um, Oh, no, I completely understand. It's a huge field is what it really is. Let me get so, that slide up. I'm still over on the, which I put that slide And I'm up. not sure if you covered it yet or not, because like I said, I did miss uh, the mm -hmm. first beginning. But one of the interesting things about HIPAA that I was looking at too is, uh, isn't it... Um, isn't the authority body for that uh, DHS? Yep, I that's in it. Yep. yep. The, the big thing, too, I think a lot of people missed out, and I used to do a consulting on that, is if you have a healthcare watch that takes your blood pressure, it's not under HIPAA because it doesn't get any money for DHS aids, right? So if you only get any federal money, they can't put any federal requirements on you, right? So... So yeah. that that's it. I, but I think they're going to change that <laughs> in the next year. Because the reason why is there's a lot of things that collecting health information, but there's no oversighting body on it, right? So I think that's going to change. But that's kind of in a nutshell. You got any more questions? No, that that's pretty much uh, the gist of what I was kind of curious about, what you covered there. Yeah, let me just peek on that uh, 66 a little more. I guess I didn't know it came out, so I might do a video on the 66 and once again loss of confidential loss of integrity loss of availability so when you do your impacts those are the big things you're going to look out for i'm gonna roll back up let's look at one of the contracts i think they had contracting examples let's see common threats impact objectives key description the security managed process i thought they had contracts assessment training so once again, if you go 66, they give you examples. Uh, contingency planning is big. Uh, BA is huge. Um, let's see. 
I thought they had the contracts out there, but let's peek at one of my favorite ones would be some of the auditing controls in this table. Audit controls, determiner activities that will be tracked and audited. So once again, determiner activities, simple questions, right? We talk about auditing, we talk about third-party risk assessment. So what's some of those questions would be, where's the PHI of risk at in your organization? What systems it is? Are you doing it in file cabinets? Are you storing it somewhere? A lot of people used to put paper records in warehouses. We don't do that as much more. But as an organization, you need to know where it's at. Here it is. What system application or processing uh, EPHI, electronic protected health, that are vulnerable to unauthorized access or inappropriate tampering? So once again, you have to be able to um, figure out the scope of your PHI again, what systems in, what's databases from an EC2, do you have it on S3s, do you got it in Aurora, uh, do you have it in, which I hate when people do, are you um, logging PHI, so now your logging information has to be, be protected at that. I've seen that people log information to help developers or find bugs, but once that gets into your logging, uh, you know, we were talking about Splunk, now you got to protect your Splunk at your HIPAA high trust level, right? Which could cost you a ton of money. And I think a lot of people miss up, miss that out. You got any questions on that, Chris? Because, but those are the good questions. Yeah, I think that part's pretty straightforward. One of the things that I was kind of curious about too is how would it work with assessment? So I thought high trust included HIPAA built into it or like if you- It does, it does. Yeah, so if you pass for high trust, Mm -hmm. then you automatically surpass HIPAA, right? You already comply with HIPAA. Yeah, Is but that... what, the, yeah, yes, you know, what they did though, which I need to check, to, what they used to do is they said, this is HIPAA, but what they did is they said, okay, high tech is the, uh, the addendum to it. They didn't put HIPAA inside high tech. They just referenced HIPAA, right? So you got to do both of them to be certified. Then high trust comes you and still... says, we're going to do the audit for both of those and give you the, the validation, the attestation or the certification that says you're doing appropriately, right? So that was kind of a weird thing. When I looked at it four or five years ago, right? You write, they just never included. High trust just already referenced HIPAA. I which, see. Which yeah, kind of, okay. I yeah, mean. Yeah, so it's it's it, kind of weird. It is but, what it is. Yeah, but too, is, but I got to double check on that. I haven't done HIPAA in a while. Like I said, the <laughs> I company I work for, we, we have a few small things in uh in, in HIPAA and high trust. So I do look at it at a high level. So uh let's look at a few more of these uh HIPAA 66. Two, if you want to dip uh dig down to it, uh me and Chris kind of was talking that HIPAA is from a job perspective, there's a ton of work out there. Uh with third parties, we talking about you gotta uh do third party assessment, supply chain for that HIPAA. So that's definitely expanding. If you go on Indeed and put HIPAA come in, there's thousands of jobs that comes up for HIPAA compliance, HIPAA certification and in, in that too. And the cool thing I like, they give you the kind of the simple questions that help you do an audit. And a lot of compliances don't, don't do that, right? So, and shout out to my man, we need to go over the, the Trello board and put some of these questions in the, in the Trello board in the future for, for, for the, for the HIPAA. <laughs> Okay, let's see what my man Billy Brown said in on a on my LinkedIn side. I'm trying to do a little better job. <laughs> do you need to add HIPAA framework to your high trust assessment for you to be compliant with HIPAA? Do you not have HIPAA uh, framework? Well, if you look back up there, high high trust gives you the uh, the CSF, which is the Common Security Framework. Once again, it's actually going to help. It's going to give you the framework to go back and do your hit to do your HIPAA assessment. Once again, you got HIPAA, high trust is an addendum to HIPAA, then your high, then your high trust is going to do you give you the uh attestation to say you good or not. So, it's HIPAA, high tech is the addendum, then high trust gives you the certification on that. I appreciate that. <laughs> this is a great resource. But yeah, once again, people know I'm a NIST guy, so I always start off with this. Let's see if NIST did the crosswalk on here, Chris. Um, they usually have a crosswalk. They did the threat. 
I should have looked and see if they did the crosswalk. Yeah, is that the crosswalk? Yes, they did. That's not that's uh, the, Appendix D. You see D? Where you is it in D? Yeah. Let me find out what page it is. I just look for Appendix D. Is it D? I can go to the top and scroll down to D. They usually have the crosswalk because I use those a lot. So a lot of times I try not to have to, which a lot of um, IT uh, auditors want. I try not to. Um, oh, there it is, the crosswalk. You're right, D105. Oh, they did it short. Oh, wow, they didn't really yeah. crosswalk it. Yeah, I thought it was B. Yeah, it's not like the other one. Um, yeah, so they talk, but I think 853 had a crosswalk. But long story short is a lot of times if you have the crosswalk, you can actually take your NIST 800-53 policies and it'll map them for the uh, HIPAA policies. Then the auditor can actually use your 800-53 and do that mapping. So that's why I try to use it. But sometimes a lot of auditors wants to see specific HIPAA policies. So you got to check with your auditors ahead of time to figure out if they're going to accept that. A lot of times, too, is um, we did a lot of, and my other job is, we put all those policies inside an Excel spreadsheet. Then that spreadsheet, we could pick those policy out and build a HIPAA policy and build a CSF policy or build an 800-53. We would just put the body of it in an Excel spreadsheet. Then depending on what you were looking for, we could actually uh, spin out of that spreadsheet and build a particular uh, policy, especially when you're talking about from an SSP uh, system security uh, um, program or plan. You can have your spreadsheet populate their plan, depending on the uh, compliances you were looking for. And we're going to talk about that a little bit on my on my on, on my platform a little more. You got any questions, Chris? Not in particular. Uh, I, I mean, it looks like they did a really good job on this update, to be honest. Oh, uh, it is. a lot of information in here it for is. 122 pages. Yeah, I'm actually going to do um, a separate video on that now. I'll probably do a separate HIPAA 66, well, NIST video. Um, I kind of want to do the major NIST documentations and put them in their, their own playlist and add it to my 55 hours of my compliance list. Try to get to 100 now. <laughs> uh, I do have a complete list of all the primary uh, NIST docs, just so you know. So I think I got, to, I got one. I got one. I got one. I might I, I might compare mine to yours though, but I, but I have one. <laughs> right. Good looking out for uh, me. something that I was just looking at here is so the on page 52, security awareness training. Okay, 52. Uh it looks like they modified that a little bit and added more to it. So okay. it looks more thorough now. So oh, wow. It, yeah, after uh going through the C, the new CSF 2.0, it looks like they kind of um pulled some stuff from this i guess because i think this yeah. was released oh they were released the same month they so probably, both csf 2.0 and this yeah they pull they pull from each other a lot of times which is cool that's one reason i like this they they give you a which can be overwhelming they give you a ton of resources and and i'm surprised they did that in a clear 122 pages because you've seen that stuff usually 400 pages 500 pages so i, I was surprised when i saw 122 but i I probably do a definitely do a um, high level video on this. Um, once again, I usually use this when I do HIPAA work and map it back to the 800-53. And if you're trying to get in compliance, uh, and we talk about this in the GRC, HIPAA high tech, that's definitely one of the major compliances. Even if you don't understand it, you need to understand it at a high level because uh, if you work for a compliance company or a large state agency, you're going to touch a little HIPAA and how that works. And, and Chris will tell you, once you get the process, it's kind of all the same, right? These are controls. These are good policies. Here's the configuration management. Here's the awareness training, right? They all kind of build on a program. But, of course, they have certain nuances to make it for hospitals, right? And you being a SME, is, that's the part you really kind of need to dig into. Yeah, and you probably already covered it regarding high trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so Ben Phillips had mentioned not all high trust is the same, or all high trust isn't the same, is what he had stated. Uh, I, I looked into 
Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So he has stated that on LinkedIn. I yeah, see, so I, I think see. that's a really good thing to mention. Uh, I don't know if you covered it before I got in here, but I did look a little bit into high trust, not too mm. much. Uh, but that's something I found interesting too, is that high trust, like they have their own, their own um, based on industry is my understanding. Is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'd be really interested to find out about like the, the scoping and assessment process for this. I mean, it's basically the same as what it looks like, but... Like you said, the different nuances. Yeah, and here so I did. Go oh, keep going, good going. I'm gonna show. Yeah. So would you start with um would you start with high trust and then you would add on the high tech? Is that how you would do it or uh it it depends. Yeah, I know I always say when I say it depends. The reason it, it depends <laughs> the reason it depends uh for for me is a lot of times, and we talked about this is when I do it, I'm usually doing it from a strictly particular security infrastructure and policy. So when you do with HIPAA, right, they're going to go into shredding, compliance, interchange. That's usually a separate person that does that, right? Because you're more talking about the inner workings from a hospital standpoint, right? How are you marking data? from a paper standpoint, right? So that's where you kind of break it up. Once again, most people know I used to work for uh, Department of Revenue for the state. So when Booz Allen came in there, I like 12 dudes and they one dude looked at shredding, one dude looked at business process, one dude looked at the IT part. So I probably would be more on the high tech because that's going to drill down into your 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 EHR systems, how you marking it, how, where you saving it at. Then two, the other part of that is uh, like we talked about this infrastructure and I, I, Chris, here you go. These are the AWS services that are HIPAA eligible. These are the ones that high trust. Most of them overlap, but then two is I can look at their infrastructure. So I'm going to look at it from an IT perspective, but there's a whole business function in there. But then oh, appreciate you. So, but yeah, he, um, but I think Ben probably got a little more, uh, probably hip <laughs> levels than I do, to be honest. Like I said, I a little bit more. Do, yeah. If you want to come over on the link, if you want to come on, on the YouTube side, we'll let him up. But yeah. So, but like I said, I, I usually do it more from a, a high tech because I'm looking at the systems. I'm looking at the uh, uh, encryption. We talked about there. Um, once again, I probably look at FIPS. I don't know if High Trust makes you do FIPS level, which is government approved encryption. So I would have to check that. So usually I look at it from a high tech, which is usually looking at the system uh, part of that and not the business processes, um, configuration management part. Right. So there's a ton of different. And two, like we talked about, from a third party assessment, I'm usually looking at the technology piece and is it encrypted? Is encrypted at rest and in transit? Is encrypted in memory? Uh, which one are all these services HIPAA, high trust uh, certified through AWS? Right. So, and so coming from it with virtually no experience or understanding of the HIPAA side of it, mm -hmm. um, but so with the HIPAA, with HIPAA in particular, aren't you mm -hmm. primarily looking and following the data itself? It's not so much the system as it's the data. That Facts. you're worried about. A hundred percent. The data is going to tell you what systems you look at because the data going through that system is going to put it in scope, right? And that's all that would matter with HIPAA is, is what data you're working with, the data sensitivity or classification. It does, but you got to remember a lot of times is they take that data, they can roll it up inside a warehouse. So if I could still pick me out in that warehouse, now that warehouse is in there, right? Or if I start sending out, come to our hospital, write an email now our print vendor is in, is it's called a baa it's an associate of us so we got to make sure they're doing the right thing right so that's kind of what that's, that's how it could really roll downhill yeah right. we was talking about the spider web and it hits right so that's how the yeah. spider web so we have print vendors um email uh vendors out um a lot of times you can send it out to testing labs right you got to send an information person getting tested so now they're BAA because you, you're sending them information. So you got to make sure they're in compliance because you're responsible for your third party vendors, right? So you can ask them for their high trust certification like you would do a SOC 2 type 2, right? 
make sure them to be certified. So that's kind of how that web starts um, spinning around. But I'm definitely going to dig into that uh, that NIST 866, especially with it only being 127 pages. So so that's going to help me yeah, dig into that. So Yeah, I think that would be a really good one. Um, there's so much information in this document. Uh, let me drop, uh, I'll drop the YouTube over there, Ben, if you want to come over, I'll drop the YouTube, uh, let me go find it. You got the YouTube channel over there? I'm struggling. Let me get over here. Uh, let's see. Got to find myself on YouTube real quick. Let's see. I got to find myself. I used, to, I used to have myself always running in the background. I don't do that so much. Okay, that's me right there. Uh, I believe I just dropped that restream link for him over there on LinkedIn. Okay, thank you. So I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm so tired. I was giving it the YouTube channel. You yeah. dropped it on LinkedIn for him? I yeah. appreciate so you. I'm tired. <laughs> That's Good right. looking out for me, Chris. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm getting old. Good looking out. Let me see. <laughs> Did you drop it on uh drop it in uh LinkedIn? You drop it in LinkedIn or YouTube? Uh I put it on LinkedIn for him. Okay. So I, I replied see. to his comment on LinkedIn. Okay, I guess I don't see it, but I trust you. I don't see it. You see Yeah, it? I replied to his comment. Oh, you replied and maybe I don't see it because you replied to him. Ben, did you get it? I said Ben got it. see i still don't see it, chris but we trust the guy over there mm. let's see i see that studio link let's see struggle so you got any more questions let's see i see. i still don't see that link let me do it ben as ben you coming up let me know let me know i'll keep it going for a little while longer oh yeah, I don't think he maybe uh maybe they blocked it. Oh, you can buy let me try then. Um let me try. Let me try. Let me yeah, I didn't see it, so but that's probably why. Let me see if I if I'm a presenter, can I drop it? Can you see it on LinkedIn, Chris? I think it came up for me because I'm I'm yep. the yeah, I need I to make it. I need to make you a mod. <laughs> that's responsibility i'm okay <laughs> and then you'll you'll start making me do work for you always you see it over there now ben he said not yet but i see you think it did you see it come up on your side chris yeah i see it on my end so he should see it so i guess since i'm the author yeah uh, that's kind of like with me not knowing how to post the links on youtube Oh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to send him to YouTube channel. I don't, oh, he's here. Let me get him in here. Perfect. Glad you could join us, Ben. What's going on? Oh, Still some much. Late night. Yeah, I, I'm always going late. I don't know why I keep doing that. I got to be at work <laughs> early in the morning. I don't know why I keep doing that. But Welcome to the channel. How are you doing? Good. One second. Trying to figure this thing out. <laughs> Yeah, three streams. Yeah, PBO different. has me drinking coffee at 9 p.m. Yeah, I know, man. I don't know why I'm coming. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm staying away from the bigger YouTubers, <laughs> man, trying to find me a little spot in the world. <laughs> I understand. Can you hear me? Yeah, you crystal clear. Yes. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Awesome. Well, yeah, I was just checking it out. It was it was a great resource. Thanks, John, for, for posting this. Oh, you're and welcome. Us. Yeah, check um, out. That's awesome. That, but, yeah, what I was saying with the high trust thing is so um, – so yeah, when you're scoping a high trust, I do high trust assessments. So like okay. high trust has like three, this is all great stuff, but three different, like recently they came up with like three different like tiers of high trust compliance, right? E1, I1, and R2. E1 is like essentials. So like four, only has like 44 controls. I1 has like 180-ish controls. And R2 can be like around 300 to like 700, right? But when you're doing R2 to make HIPAA, to make sure HIPAA is included, you need to 
because you can ha type in scoping factors that will say like do you process you know phi right you can say no right because any anyone can get a high trust certificate any organization can they don't have to just be doing hipaa stuff mm -hmm. but then there's also a, a tag at the bottom that that talks about other regulatory compliance frameworks that you have to be compliant with there's like pci there's iso mm -hmm. there's hipaa yeah. whatever so you have to add that thing click hipaa and then it will add the hipaa controls into oh. high trust um so that's kind of like on the r2 side for the most part it is what it is right a lot but it's like sock 2 right like a lot of people don't really know what they're looking at oh, all yeah. the time and that's really easy to to because there's so much out there yeah i'm 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 i'm, I'm anti actually sock 2 but that's a whole nother the, the reason why <laughs> i am is it seems it's changed over years but when i first looked at it it seemed like it was agreement between the vendor and the person paid for it then every time i asked for it the stuff had data it wasn't in scope so it was like they only picked the stuff they were good at from from when i used to look at it and i was very upset with sock. i think it changed over the years but when i first looked yeah. at sock type it, two it, it, it didn't impress it me, yeah it depends i mean it depends obviously based on the organization the auditor mm -hmm. the yeah. the information the clients that care right yeah, like you 100%. may have clients that didn't care about what you were like maybe it was just you that were using that one thing right yeah that one service and they like well we're not going to get any bang for a buck if we just hit this one thing and no clients are bugging us about it clients are bugging us about application a and b but not c well but what but, but i think a lot of times is you chime in on this because since you do this and when i do a lot of more NIST and federal a lot of people doing third-party assessments don't know what to ask for so they don't mm -hmm. need to know that they can ask additional questions they just assumed it was correct when they got it right they said oh it must be correct because it's high trust or it's sock type two people yeah. never asked any additional questions yeah yeah that's that's a very that's a very good point um yeah there's a lot of that's where there's a lot of opportunity i think in the you know you were talking about the you, you know mentioned the term grc but like mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of folks at organizations that are like asking for sock reports Mm -hmm. they're in procurement right or they're whatever you know but they don't have yeah. a subject matter expertise of what the heck they're looking yeah. at they're using terms that were around 13 years ago There's, mm -hmm. but regardless they're just looking for it to check a box but again mm -hmm. they don't know what they're so i guess what i'm saying is is like with some with some you know with some free learning and some like investment in just what, what's free literature out there like linkedin learning stuff like that like you can become like you know security is a big thing but you can become an expert or like pseudo um mm -hmm. you know pseudo uh you can speak the language yeah and there's a, i think there's a big opportunity for folks that can actually prove that they can understand this why an organization would get these things i guess we, we were talking about this a uh, crispy taking out my time i'm not that's my guy we were talking about third party assessment like you said coming out of procurement kind of being an entry point to get younger people or new people in the in the door because you have to do that and that's a small part of grc but much bigger now because everybody's doing more supply chain because of Caseus and Lockwood J. So I think that might be an entry point for new people to get in with third party assessments. Like you said, coming to procurement, coming through. I work for big states, R5 and RPs. Mm -hmm. You got to check those. What's your thoughts on that? I'm quizzing you now. You came up on my channel. I'm quizzing you. Go ahead. Yeah. So what's, what's, your what's, your question? <laughs> so what's your thoughts on that? What's the question again? It's on What's, um third party assessment, new people getting in from procurement, like you said, R5, RP. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. I think I mean I think it, I mean there's definitely a there's definitely a shortage in a lot of different talent areas, cybersecurity and being one of them. Um and you know, there's more ways to get into this type of thing than just starting as an associate IT auditor like you would on my team. Like folks coming into it blind you know you don't know you have no you don't have any bad habits right you have no habits so you're learning it from the ground up there you're, you're looking at stuff from a different vantage point of like auditing and giving it an audit opinion but on the you know uh new client vendor assessment area you just need to be able to understand why you're asking because that organization is going to have their they're like doing their own audit right yeah, they're asking yeah. they, they got their own questions so yeah. i think the best thing that that person can do doing that is do you know do you actually understand the questions that are being asked right and in and, and the questions that are being asked do you know why you're answering asking it to that that vendor right yeah. do you know like if, if there's a physical security part or like uh 
you know, if there's a physical security part and you know that the vendor's not hosted in the cloud, right? Like, why are you asking about it, right? right. So, like, or I probably didn't say that correctly, but you know what I mean. No, no, like, I got what you're saying. Yeah, like so. So I think so. But I think there's a a good opportunity for people to, you know, grow and improve in that in that area of 100. Um, yeah, yeah. We were kind of just kind of talking about that. <clears throat> like you said, that's kind of why I try to bring up AWS. These components are certified by AWS, right? And that's that yeah. shared responsibility. So what questions do you need to ask AWS? A lot of times I got certifications, but like you said, you still got to configure it to meet that for your whole architecture. So mm -hmm. what does that look like from a new person and you going custom? Because the cloud is here. So I tell people, pick a cloud and try to understand it the best you can. What's your thoughts on the cloud? Is, is now in here or? Uh Mo basically 98 percent of our clients are all using some pieces of cloud infrastructure um i would say a lot more now are using uh, the managed services mm -hmm. as of recent which are which is you know just reduces the risk appetite that they have to own um but uh, but yeah as you know allows organizations to be as, as as highly available and as agile as they need to be and also allows them to do more without some of those more technical roles that they mm -hmm. had to do you know pay internally they're just able to you know pay that to the cloud service provider and handle you know the, infrastructure the, management right yeah the, the only pushback I, <laughs> I do every now and then i get smaller um vendors or smaller clients go i'm in aws i'm good i'm like no you you responsible for the figuring it right they think because they're there they're good i'm like now you you own a piece of this right of and mm -hmm. in the cloud so i think a lot of smaller clients seem to miss that you still got to configure it right and you yeah. still own the pieces of that so I, I i think smaller clients are still learning that that kind of piece yeah well the, it'll come around i mean they can play organizations can play that game for a little bit um, yeah but yeah until they you know until they have a client that you know puts it in a contract and they oh you know, then then it's then it you know then it is what it is right yeah, and I work for big companies, so we 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 had floors of lawyers, man. If you know DPAs, data processing agreements now, um, cyber insurance now. So I used to look at that as far as RFPs and RFIs. So all of that kind of was included now. With like you said, they put stuff in contracts for SLAs, and if you don't meet them, you can, you can get fined or you can owe some of that money back to your client, right? So I think that's part of cybersecurity, and a lot of people don't don't talk about that that legal part of cybersecurity. Yeah, for sure. You want to say anything? I'm going to shut it down. I'm dozing off. No, so I got, I got, I got, I got nothing. It's late. I was just, you know, I appreciate you coming to, up though, man. To get, do a couple things. And I saw this and I was like, Oh snap, I'm going to check it out. And then I like, you know, 42 minutes later. <laughs> I appreciate it. Right? You need to go start your yeah, YouTube channel great. and give, give us a little more high tech and high trust, man. Like no, I said, I, yeah, I, I got with you. I, 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 I think I first, I I think I first met you at a like an ISSA event. You used to go to that, right? Information Systems Security Association. I did. Maybe? I did. Yep. Yep. I did. Is I think back we, before COVID. Yeah. But is that where we met before? I think it was like, uh, it might have been like an Ice Miller at Ice Miller, like right yeah, before. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. it was like March 13th, 2020. I just oh, got wow. back from Key West. The world Man. was normal. And I was like, Wow. And I knew what happened because the client that day told me that like they're shutting their offices down, and I'm like, and then I smell, you know, and it was it was it was a great event um, in it the was, evening, huh? but uh, but I knew like this is the last time we're gonna be around people for a while. They, like, they don't. That's they don't, crazy. They don't even do I squared in our area anymore, so that's kind of I think they shut it down. I don't I don't think they're doing it anymore. Uh, they, they they're still ISSA. Uh, are, are they still doing events? I I, I didn't see. Yeah, it. they're doing events still. They, I went to the Christmas party. Okay, I might have to look uh, it out. I I really enjoyed those. So. Yeah, no, they're good. They're good. It's good for yeah, good for networking. Good to meet people. You know. Yeah. We eat were, pizza, we, learn some stuff. Yeah, we were just talking about that in another study hall that you should go to your local event because you meet people. And like I was telling them, people would bring jobs to those events that at their yeah. company they were working and the networking was super good. And um, for so sure. yeah, I tell people definitely it can't hit your local group because the camaraderie was super good and um. Especially in ours, there was a lot of super smart people that would present. 
And the pizza was good, even though I need to go on a diet. That's a whole that's a yeah. whole other issue. But I appreciate well, hey, thanks, you summing up, man. Yeah, thanks for thanks for thanks for having it. Thanks for inviting me. How do I add it to my like follow thing? Which uh like do you post on how do I know about this each month? Like when do you oh, how frequent do you do this? Uh I do this, uh Chris is saying I do it once a once a week, but usually it's usually Tuesday or Wednesday. I I can't figure out my day. Long story okay. short, I've been working too much. But if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can mm. put um i forgot okay. you can say be notified when i put out a new yeah. video all right i'll do that it'll be my I, first channel i appreciate <laughs> you man we definitely gonna have to link back up and i'm about to i might have to interview you as a special guest i'm gonna start uh, doing my interviews again yeah i see yeah so we, all right. yeah, yeah for the next video for hip and uh, yeah high, high high trust. Trust there. yeah we yes, can sir. talk about that i appreciate you for coming up man see ya have I'll a good evening you. everyone thank you very much you I guys see. have a good one I see you in the local team soon, man. I got to go back to the high square. Thanks for coming yes, up, Chris. Uh, you'll see me and him on LinkedIn with the GRC study hall. So me and Chris Whitlock is usually in the GRC study hall. Um, I'm going to hang out for just a quick brief second if anybody got any more uh, questions. Tech, uh, shout out to my man, Ben Phillips. Obviously, he's from my state because we went to the our local security group. PBL be talking too much, so people be remembering. Be remembering, but now nah, definitely gonna use him as a HIPAA resource. He does it uh, daily, and I do it probably once every quarter. So we're gonna definitely dig down into that 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 HIPAA skill set. Um, definitely hiring. Definitely on um, LinkedIn. Definitely a super super high resource. Uh, once again, I'm glad he joined us. Uh, once again, so please subscribe. Come check out my YouTube channel gonna hang out a little bit checking out on my linkedin it seems to be holding up well see if anybody have any more questions i want to appreciate everybody from checking out let thank you let's do this every wednesday i should i need to do it on tuesday so it won't bump up against grc study hall chris but I, a lot of times i just run out of time i need to start making more time i've just been a little tired and a little burnt out recently but it is what it is once again i want to appreciate everybody for joining me i'm out everybody have a good weekend hump day's over weekend's almost here i just gotta make it thanks for joining